Chapter 2, The Growlers As endurance steamed down the River Thames toward the sea, however, World War I boiled up in Europe. Great Britain was preparing to join the war against Germany. Shackleton had no choice but to telegraph the Admiralty and place the entire ship, crew, and stores at the Royal Navy's disposal. Two military members of the crew immediately resigned from the expedition to rejoin their regiments. Shackleton and the rest of the men on board Endurance were tortured by indecision. They were all patriotic subjects of a country heading into war, and yet they all now burned to voyage south. They waited anxiously for word of their fate. At last, Winston Churchill, who was first Lord of the Admiralty at the time, sent a telegram. Proceed. On August 8th, the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition left England behind. With mixed emotions, the crew watched England's shores slip away. On the eve of Britain's entry into war, every man knew he was leaving his country at a critical time and would be out of all contact for at least a year and a half. But they set sail nevertheless. There would be no turning back, as Shackleton wrote home in a telegram. We are leaving now to carry on our white warfare. By October, they were in Buenos Aires, on the coast of Argentina, where there was some shuffling of the crew. A few of the original members were discharged for drunkenness, and replacements were hired on the spot. Argentine sightseers crowded the docks to see the world-famous explorers and showered the crew with invitations to dinners, dances, and cabarets. A motley pack of 69 half-wild sled dogs from Canada was brought on board. Not a single member of the crew had any experience of driving a dog team, but that wasn't the sort of detail to worry the confident Shackleton. The dogs were housed in kennels built on deck, where they snapped and lunged at anyone who passed too close. The Argentine naval band played the British in Argentine national anthems with an accompaniment of barking, growling, snarling, and howling from the dogs as Endurance set sail on the next leg of the voyage. It was October 26, 1914. Unbeknownst to the commander, the ship carried an additional newcomer. A young sailor named Percy Blackborrow was hiding in a locker aided by William Bakewell, another young seaman. Once the ship was three days out from Buenos Aires and there was no chance of returning, Blackborough was brought forward to face a furious commander. As Mrs. Chippy, the cat, rubbed against Shackleton's legs, the commander looked the stowaway up and down. Do you know that on these expeditions we often get very hungry and if there is a stowaway available, he is the first to be eaten? He warned, ignoring the cat purring at his feet. And there he is, Percy Blackborough, the stowaway with Mrs. Chippy, who was actually a tomcat, after Blackborough was brought before the boss, who was made the ship's steward. Next page. Blackborough was not dismayed. <laughs> they'd, they'd get a lot more meat off you, sir. Shackleton turned away to hide a grin and told Frank Wilde to turn the lad over to the bosun, but added, introduce him to the cook first. The crew was somewhat in awe of their commander, whom they all called Boss. As Dr. James McElroy said, Shackleton could be a very frightening kind of individual, like Napoleon. He was a very stern-looking and fixed you with a steely eye. In the months that followed, they would learn to follow him almost without question. Shackleton was a master at keeping his crew working together. Whenever he found two men who had quarreled and were not speaking to each other, he told them, Stop and forget it, and made them shake hands. He never let them forget that their strength lie in unity. Because seasons are reversed in the southern hemisphere, spring was well underway as the coast of South America slipped away to the northwest. Endurance headed for South Georgia Island, one of the sub-Antarctic islands on the edge of the Antarctic Convergence. The Convergence, also called the Polar Front, is where frigid, oxygen-rich water from the south cold water holds more oxygen than warm water, mixes with warmer water from the north, causing a thermal swap or slow churning in the water that pulls nutrients up from the ocean floor. This shifting front of rich ocean, about 25 miles wide, is the most fertile ecosystem in the world, supporting awesome numbers of fish, seabirds, seals, and whales. Whaling first brought people to South Georgia Island, and it was to a whaling station that Endurance headed 
as its final stop before challenging the Antarctic. Gritviken was a Norwegian outpost on Stromness Bay, a natural harbor at the base of the island's rugged alpine cliffs and glaciers. Snow squalls and heavy seas made visibility poor and forced endurance to creep forward with the engines dead slow as it headed into Stromness Bay. A whaling boat was spotted in the fog, and Endurance gave two blasts of its whistle. Immediately, the Sitka came alongside Endurance, and with a whale carcass acting as a bumper between the two vessels and the heavy waves, piloted the ship into Gritviken. Endurance landed at South Georgia Island on November 5th, three months after leaving England. The whaling station was a rough spot, with the carcasses of blue and humpback whales putrefying in the midnight sun and the harbor red with blood and shimmering with grease around the oil factory. Billowing clouds of steam rose from the plant where blubber was being boiled down. According to Harry McNeish, the ship's Scottish carpenter, ye could snuff the aroma of ye were five miles out to windot. The crew soon gave the harbor the sarcastic name, the scent bottle. From the mountainsides echoed the harsh donkey bray of Gentoo penguins, the screech of squaws, and the bellowing of elephant seals. When Endurance docked at Gritviken, the Canadian wolf dogs were led off to gorge themselves on whale meat, and they added their barking and snarling to the din that echoed from the Alps of the Southern Ocean. If you looked on the previous page, that image right there, that's Gritviken Whaling Station on South Georgia Island. The whaling station employed approximately 200 men of different nationalities, although most of them were Norwegian. Tons of whale meat, bone, and scrap blubber lay riding, rotting around the station. Back to page 14. The Norwegian whalers were the only source of information about current conditions in the Antarctic, and the news they had for Shackleton was bad. The ice pack surrounding the continent had been particularly heavy that year, and it wasn't breaking up as quickly as usual. None of the experienced whalers could remember ever seeing the pack so far north. A bad year for ice, was the terse description Shackleton heard over and over. Although he had planned to stay at Gritviken only a short while, the boss decided to wait one or two weeks longer for the warm weather to break up the ice. Meanwhile, the crew made the most of their time ashore. Hurley was fearless in scaling the cliffs around the harbor in the pursuit of great photographs. And he had to lug around a large box camera to do it. Some of the men practiced skiing. Because they were so far north or so far south, rather, the sun shone around the clock and the crew was resourceful in finding entertainment. There were practical jokes, including one on Hubert Hudson, the navigator who was generally considered an oddball and a sitting duck for jokes. Told there was a costume party ashore, Hudson was persuaded to dress in a bedsheet with a teapot lid tied with ribbons to his head. In this bizarre getup, Hudson made a grand entrance into a party at the whaling station, only to find himself the sole person in costume. From then on, Hudson was nicknamed Buddha. In all, Endurance spent a month at Gritviken. Each day of delay meant putting the expedition in jeopardy, however. If Shackleton did not reach the edge of the continent before the end of the short Antarctic summer, the ice would shut him out. On the advice of the whalers, Shackleton had the decks of Endurance loaded with extra coal for ramming through the ice. Then, on December 5th, a little more than two weeks before Midsummer's Day, Endurance set sail from Gritviken. Huge, dripping slabs of bloody whale meat meant for dog food hung from the rigging out of the reach of the animals. Behind them, the whaling factory blasted its whistle and saluted the ship with rounds of harpoon gunfire. Endurance was on its way to the frozen continent. And you can see on page 14 in that image a blue whale being flensed at Gritviken. The whalers stripped the carcass of blubber and boil it down into oil. According to Hussey, the harbor had a most appalling stench from the dead whales moored in the harbor awaiting, flensing. In that image at the top of page 15, those are some bull elephant seals on South Georgia Island. Meteorologist Leonard Hussey described the noise that sleeping elephant seals make as suggestive of a nightmare or a guilty conscience. The inspirations of the breath are irregular gas, the expirations tremulous wheezes. The body shakes violently from time to time, and the foreflippers are ever nervously moving about. Let's continue the bottom of page 15. Only three days later, they met their first ice. Large chunks called growlers that scraped and rumbled past the sides of the ship. 
the Norwegians had been right. The ice had never been seen so far north. They were still 600 miles from the nearest coastline and hadn't even crossed the Antarctic Circle. Yet ahead to the south in the Weddell Sea, brilliant blue icebergs shone in the polar sun like the walls and ramparts of a fortress.